So you've heard all about IP addresses. You know that the internet works via IP addresses. If you've seen my Cat Explains the Internet video, you know all about what an IP address is and how it gets your traffic across the network. And if you've watched my Cat Explains subnetting video, you know how they're carved up and assigned to organizations. But how exactly do you get your IP address? You never have to type it in your computer. When's the last time you manually configured an IP address on your computer? Okay, well maybe if you have a lab or a VM or you're an enthusiast, you probably do this every day. But most people, they don't have to tell their computer what their IP address is. They don't even know what their IP address is until someone asks them. If I walked up to someone on the street and said, hey, dude, I know your IP. It's 2463-127-902 they would have no idea that that's not their IP, or that it can't have a 902 in it. You might know that IP addresses come in all different sizes, and they come in different varieties, like the kind without letters and the kind that has letters. And you might already know that if you run Windows 10, your IP address will always begin with a 2. Just kidding, I made that one up. Don't believe that. But how do these addresses get assigned to your computer? It happens automagically, and it's something that we call DHCP. DHCP, otherwise pronounced to Hookupa, is the Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. Not only does it tell your computer what its IP address is, but it gives it all sorts of information. If you've ever worked in an office, and you have an IP phone, and you just plug it in and it works, and it just talks to the phone system without you having to do anything or enter anything, that's the Hookupa. When you plug your network cable in and Windows is like identifying, that's the hookupa. When you get on Wi-Fi and the only thing that you have to do is pick a network and maybe type in a key and everything else just works, that's the hookupa. That's the hookupa. But seriously, DHCP is a really awesome protocol. We use it every day, we don't think about it. It's really interesting and it's very unique. And the reason I like it is because it's one of the few protocols you can use without having any IP address. How's it work? Well, everything that connects to the internet ever has a DHCP client. And the person that runs your network runs a DHCP server. So if you're talking about your home network, you run a DHCP server. Where is it? Well, it's probably in that thing that you call a router, but is really a combination router, switch, wireless access point, DHCP server, DNS relay, and network address translation enabled firewall. But that box is more than just a DHCP server, it's also a DHCP client. What? Well, your computers are DHCP clients of the DHCP server on your network, the one in your router. But your router is also a DHCP client to the server that your ISP uses. Remember, there's two different sets of IP assignments happening here. There's your local assignment that your computer gets from your own network, from the equipment that you operate which theoretically could be part of the equipment your ISP gave you, but it's equipment that you operate. And then there's your public IP address that gets assigned to you by your ISP that your router uses to talk to the rest of the world. If we're talking about IPv4, you probably only get one address from your ISP, maybe two if you ask nicely, but they're assigned to you via DHCP. If you're talking about IPv6, those new crazy long newfangled addresses, you might get one from your ISP, but you may get an entire block of them. How many do you get from your ISP? Well, a lot of times you get a slash 48 or a slash 64, and that's a lot of addresses. Side note, this is one of the reasons why it's so rare to have to NAT IPv6 probably be a future video on NAT. If you're not familiar with NAT, NAT stands for Natalie from the Facts of Life. So DHCP is typically used to assign you your IP address and subnet mask, your default gateway, in other words what router you should send everything that's not local to, your DNS servers, and potentially it could be used to configure your time servers, your win servers, your, your proxy. It's also how zero touch configuration works. When you plug in an IP phone and it knows where the phone system is, or when you connect a piece of network gear like an access point and it automatically pulls down its configuration. A lot of those settings are configured through DHCP so that every piece of equipment doesn't have to be touched either physically or even you know through some web interface or some shit. If you've ever network booted or pixie booted, those settings like where the boot server is and what image file to start loading, those come through DHCP. In fact, there's quite a list of things that you can configure through DHCP if your clients are capable. And that's the beauty of DHCP. It's an extensible protocol. You can shove whatever the fuck you want in there. If I decide today that, hey, you know what, option uh, F7 means uh, fuck you, I can put that in my THCP server and clients will get that when they get their IP address. And if they care, then they'll do something. If not, then they'll probably ignore it. 
I'm sure F7 is already in use by something and I'll put it on the screen if it is. Okay, so all that sounds cool, but how does it actually work? How do I get an IP address if I don't even have an IP address to talk on the network? Well, it's simple. The four stages of a standard DHCP handshake are Dora, discover, offer, request, accept. Your client, having come onto a new network and not having any IP address, sends out a discover packet to the broadcast address. It sends it from IP, all zeros, because it has no IP address, to all ones, which is the broadcast address, and it says, hey, DHCP discover, I need an IP address. And in that packet, it also provides some information that might help a DHCP server give it an IP address, like what its name is, what its MAC address is, what IP it might prefer. You might think, well, why does my computer prefer an IP? Why would a computer ever prefer an IP? That sounds ridiculous. That sounds like pussy shit to me. Well, a lot of operating systems, in fact, most of them, will prefer the IP that they previously had. They'll remember what IP that they had last, and they'll ask for it so that they get it again if it's available. So the client sends a discover packet to broadcast, and any DHCP servers that see it can make it an offer. It can say, hey, I can give you an IP address. Here's what it would look like. You want it? That offer comes from the DHCP server's IP back to 0.0.0.0. Obviously, this is not a unique IP, but there's enough unique information in the DHCP packet that other clients that are asking for an IP at the same time won't confuse it for their offer. At that point, the client can either accept or decline the offer. There might be a bunch of reasons why it might decline it. It might be configured to only accept IPs on a specific subnet. It may have already taken an offer from another DHCP server. And that's the beauty. There could be multiple DHCP servers and they all send offers and the client gets to pick which one it likes. Just like when you go to a shady used car dealer and they submit a loan on your behalf to like 20, you know, 20 lending companies and they all come back at the same time and you're like, okay, well this one looks like the best one. If a client likes the offer, it sends a DHCP request. It says, hey, I want that IP. It still doesn't technically have it yet, so it's still sending from all zeros. And finally, the server either says, yeah, okay, you have it now, or oops, never mind, I can't give it to you. Typically, the server has already really reserved the IP for you, so the second you request it, it acknowledges that you have it, and it's at this point that it gives you a lease. It says, you can have this IP for this amount of time, and if you need it longer, you have to renew it first. That way, IPs aren't stuck being reserved to devices that have already gone offline for some amount of time. If the server says no at this point, it's called a negative acknowledgement, or a NAC. NAC stands for Mr. NAC, that guy on Eureka's Castle with the pots and pans. And once the client gets to the acknowledgement, it's at this point that the client actually has that IP address. It holds the lease and it can assign it to itself. Now that's not where it ends. At some point in the future, if your computer is still using that lease and it's about to expire, and this is operating system independent, it will send a renewal request to the server that it got the IP from asking if it can have it longer. And the server at this point can either accept it or reject it with a negative acknowledgement. The client is not allowed to use that IP address longer than the lease says so. If the client is unable to renew the IP or it can't contact the DHCP server, it has to unconfigure that IP address when the lease expires. At this point, typically computers will go back to an auto configuration or a PIPA or a fallback IP. And this means that if there's a catastrophic failure of DHCP or just if a network has no DHCP, all the unconfigured computers can still talk to each other on this predetermined rendezvous network that everything goes to if it can't get an IP address automatically. If your computer shuts down its network connection gracefully, like for example if you're shutting your operating system down, your computer may release the lease back to the DHCP server so that it can be reused by another client. This is done through a DHCP release message. And once again, the client has to immediately stop using the IP address. So typically this happens right as the network stack is shutting down. So that's how your computer gets IP addresses. Now how does the server give them out? Well, the DHCP server decides which IPs you're gonna get. There's no real way to know that those IPs are actually the real IPs for a particular subnet. A client kind of just has to blindly trust whatever DHCP server responds to it. This means that running a rogue DHCP server on a network is a real big security problem because it not only means that you're breaking real clients that can't get a real IP that actually works, but it means that you're able to push settings like DNS settings and default gateway settings to clients and then maliciously spy on the traffic or intercept it or do all kinds of weird shit. 
Microsoft's DHCP server absolutely refuses to operate on a network if it detects that that network is part of an Active Directory domain and it's not an authorized server for that network. It doesn't stop non-Windows servers from operating or maliciously modified Windows servers from operating, but it does cut down on people accidentally installing the DHCP service on a computer and really fucking up their network. DHCP servers are configured to be authoritative for a specific set of IP addresses, sometimes called a scope. A single DHCP server may do DHCP for multiple subnets, either by having multiple interfaces, uh, you know, like a single server is connected to two different networks, so it's doing DHCP for the address space on each network, or through DHCP relays. So let's say you have a large company with a handful of different subnets, and you don't want to have to put a DHCP server on every single one of them. What do you do? Well, most commercial routers include a feature called a DHCP relay, or a DHCP helper, where they will monitor for broadcast packets from clients looking for a DHCP lease and relay them to a list of known authorized DHCP servers, even if they're not on that network. When the router sees a broadcast packet coming from a client that's looking for a DHCP lease, it seamlessly relays this to a list of pre-configured DHCP servers. They don't have to be on the same subnet or even connected to that router because the router converts the broadcast packet to a unicast packet so they can go across the network normally. This means you can have a DHCP server anywhere as long as you have a router that's configurable with a DHCP relay or a helper. The router also adds its own IP into the DHCP packet as an option called DHCP Relay IP Address. This way, when the packet gets to the server, the server knows which network it came from, so it knows which scope or set of pre-configured IPs to pull from. Depending on the DHCP server implementation, there's a lot of flexibility about how IP addresses can be assigned to clients. Typically, they just come from a pool from, you know, from lowest to highest, whichever one is available first, but clients can also be given a reservation so that they always have the same IP address. The downside is that that IP address goes unused if that client isn't on the network. The DHCP server can also be configured with all kinds of authorization and security measures. DHCP servers that support network access protection can talk to the client before giving it an IP address and require that the client be up to date, have antivirus software installed, be a member of the company's domain, all kinds of various checks to make sure that you're not giving IP addresses to random rogue machines that wind up on the network. This doesn't stop them from being on the network because they can always monitor the traffic to figure out where the router is and what the subnet is and configure their IP manually. But it does prevent misguided people from accidentally plugging unauthorized equipment into the network and immediately being able to talk to you know the enterprise. Another thing DHCP servers can do is called conflict detection. Before they give out an IP address that they have an available lease for, they might ping or try to contact that IP address just to make sure that no one's actually using it. This is really important if you stand up a brand new DHCP server and it doesn't know anything about any of the clients that are already on the network. So what bad address means is that the DHCP server tried to give out an address and it was already in use. So the DHCP server pings it to see if something's using it first, and if it does, it goes on to the next one. Because this is a new DHCP server, it doesn't know about all of the leases that the old DHCP server knew about. If they got a DHCP lease from a different or a previous DHCP server or an old server that you replaced, you don't want the new DHCP server giving everyone someone else's IP address and causing all kinds of network conflicts. Now in reality, most modern operating systems will detect that an IP address is already in use by monitoring ARP traffic prior to trying to use it, but it is a feature that you definitely want to enable to prevent some serious hassles. And finally, let's talk about IPv6. In the IPv6 realm, DHCP has a reduced role because by default, most clients will auto-configure their own IP address. When a new client comes on an IPv6 network, they either listen for a router advertisement or send a router solicitation to find out what network they're on. The router tells them what their prefix is, you know, what subnet they're on and how large it is. And the router can even send the client all the same stuff that a normal DHCP server would have sent in IPv4, such as DNS server information. This is called Slack, Stateless Automatic Address Configuration. The client finds out what network it's on, and it pretty much just assigns itself its own random IP address on that network using a predefined algorithm. 
IPv6 networks are so huge that the possibility of having an arbitrary conflict is very low. And even if there is a conflict, once again, this would be detected by the operating system. Instead of ARP, IPv6 uses ICMPv6 for this purpose. But there is still a role for DHCP and IPv6. There's actually three of them. Number one is stateful configuration. You can have your DHCP server set up just the same as it used to be in IPv4, where your DHCP server manages the pool of addresses, and then you do a whole Dora, and your client gets the IP from the DHCP server. This is really helpful if you have specific IP addresses or a specific IP address format that you want your clients to have, because with Slack, they pretty much just make up the host portion of their IP address, and it just looks like a bunch of random shit. If you need clients to be able to get lease reservations or to have a specific format where each segment of your IPv6 address means something to your company, then you want stateful DHCP. There's also a stateless or hybrid configuration where your clients use Slack to configure their own IP address based on the router's information, but they still contact DHCP in order to get other information like DNS servers, network boot information, etc. This is what you'd want to use if you don't care what your addresses look like, but you still have something that your router doesn't support, like you have network boot settings that have to be pushed to your clients. And finally, there's DHCP PD. That doesn't stand for physical disability, that stands for prefix delegation. And this is how you, as a customer of your ISP, can request an entire prefix or an entire range of addresses for your home business or organization. Many ISPs will not only give you a single IPv6 address, they'll give you a slash 48 or a slash 64. DHCP PD is how your routing equipment would request the delegation of this chunk of IP address space. Traditional DHCP only requests a single address. So I hope that's a lot more information than you ever needed to know about DHCP. If you like DHCP, you like this video, or you just learned something that you didn't know before, click the like button below. If you have questions, concerns, comments, obviously, comment below. If the subscribe button's red, that means you need to press it right now for instant savings, and consider supporting me on Patreon. Go ahead, I wanna hear your craziest DHCP-related stories. Tell me about that time someone plugged in a rogue X into your company's Y and caused Z to happen. Until next time, I'm Nell saying peace. Switch combination router switch router switch router switch wireless access point DHCP server DNS relay and network address translation enabled firewall.